Uh, welcome into Real Deal Sports Talk with KP. It's your boy. It's November 16th, 2019. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate every time I see my listeners' numbers go up or get comments from you guys or you reach out through the website at www.realdealsportstalkwithkp.com. Many stories to talk about, many heated topics to talk about this week. I didn't come at you during the week because I wanted to make sure I wasn't being reactionary. <clears throat> um, because some of these things we'll talk about today are, you know, sensitive topics, it seems like, this week. Uh, a lot of name-calling, a lot of reactionary statements, a lot of villainizing, a lot of what I am perceiving as whitewashing. Um, of a, a situation that uh, by no means was right by anybody involved. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, we've got our week 11 picks to make. Uh, Colin Kaepernick's got a workout today uh, taking place here in just a few hours. Mello has found a new home. The Astros are stealing signs reportedly in their World Series winning year of 2017. So we'll talk about all these things. Um, I'm going to start with my picks today. Let's start with my picks. Uh, then we'll get into some of the other stories that came out uh, this week to talk about. All right. So we all saw what happened Thursday night. Okay. I had Cleveland in that game. I thought they'd beat Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, yes, has been playing well. Cleveland it has the most talent. You figure they're going to have these games here and there where they're able to actually put a little bit of something together against a team that's not quite on the same level talent-wise. We'll talk about what happened throughout this game and during this game in a few minutes. <clears throat> I did have Cleveland winning this game. Cleveland won the game. All right, Sunday's action. I'm going to take Carolina over Atlanta. Atlanta, yes, is super talented. Atlanta, um, yes, they beat the Saints. Atlanta, yes, they have Matt Ryan. Yes, they have Julio Jones. But I don't trust Atlanta. Uh, they're far too inconsistent. They're trying to now play for coach's job in a sense. Uh, everybody knows that Dan Quinn's uh, tenure is probably up at the end of this year. You've got pride scenarios. You've got guys whose contracts are coming up. You've got guys who are possibly thinking of, you know, uh, there's going to be a new regime in here. I'm playing for just to stay on this team next year. Type mentality going on in Atlanta. I, however, don't think that's going to help them today. Um, or tomorrow, I mean, against Carolina. I think Christian McCaffrey, with what he's doing right now, is special. I know Dalvin Cook's getting a lot of the press right now. Uh, but what Christian McCaffrey's doing with that team, with that quarterback, uh, they don't have the talent they used to have. Their game plan coming into the season was something completely different than what they're doing right now. I think Carolina gets this one. I think they have enough of a defense to stop anything Atlanta brings on the offensive side of the ball. Look, Matt Ryan probably still goes for 350 in this one. Julio Jones probably gets around 100 yards, maybe a score in this one. I think Christian probably comes in around 250 all-purpose yards in this game. It could be close. It is a division battle. You never know. But I'll take Carolina in that one. I'm going to stick with Detroit over Dallas. Uh, I'm a Lions fan. I don't pick against my team. Do I think they have a very high probability of winning this game? No, I think it's next to nothing as far as the probability that they win this game. I'm not going to pick against them. Stafford's out again this week with the, uh, the broken uh, processes in his spine and his back. Uh, still being investigated there as to how they handled him on the injury report. So I'm not going to pick against my team. Um, the only game they really haven't been in this year uh, where they really played horrible, lost by double digits, was against Minnesota. And they still put up 32 or 31 points in that game. So I would expect Driscoll to probably go out and throw for another 250 yards. You're going to see Harrison and Jones get some get some action. You'll see uh, Ty Johnson can clear the crush, cleared concussion protocol, so he'll be out there for them. They're going to try and run it a little more. Uh, I expect a lot more intermediate routes. I expect a lot more to the tight ends this week. Um, 
but expect him to try and take his shots and be mobile in this game uh, to take advantage of, you know, this lack of experience with Driscoll there filling in for Stafford. Dallas, they could easily run away with this one with Ezekiel Elliott. We'll see how Amari Cooper's injury is going. If Dak Prescott's on this week, does the defense come to play? How many sacks are they going to get? Do they force some turnovers against Detroit and Driscoll? Very likely. Uh, but again, I'm not going to pick against my team. I'll take Indianapolis over Jacksonville as well. Brissett's going to come back and play. Jacksonville's been here and there. Uh, they're pretty one-dimensional at this point. I know Nick Foles is back, so we'll see. A little changing of the guard from Nick Foles to Minshew. Back to Nick Foles now as he's coming back from the collarbone injury. We'll see what he's able to bring to the table in this game. I think they stumble a little bit this week. They're going to rely on the running game, I think, heavily. And I think Indianapolis tries to key in on stopping just that. I'll take Buffalo over Miami. I'll take Baltimore over Houston. I think this is going to probably be the game of the week uh, with these two young quarterbacks and Deshaun Watson and Lamar Jackson. However, I do think Baltimore wins this game. I'll take Minnesota to beat Denver. I think they're just going to run the ball. They're going to use Dalvin Cook. They're going to use the play action. I do think Denver will have a showing. Um, I think they get a couple interceptions in this one. They might get a forced fumble in this one couple sacks, but ultimately Denver's not going to have enough, I don't think, from Brandon Allen at the quarterback position to win this game. I'll take New Orleans to bounce back and beat division rival Tampa Bay. I'll take Washington over the Jets. Why? Yeah, why not? Both of these teams are garbage this year. I'll take the 49ers to bounce back from their first loss to beat Arizona in the division. I'll take Oakland over Cincinnati. I think New or um, New England, excuse me, will beat Philadelphia. I'm taking the Chargers this week to upset the Chiefs on Monday Night Football, and on Sunday night, I really, this one is probably the one I struggled with the most going back and forth when I was trying to make my picks. A lot of them, it was like, okay, that's an easy game, uh, I'm, uh, or I'm picking Detroit regardless. This one, Chicago and the Rams, with the way both of these teams are playing, with some of the defensive players they have that can change a game. I really struggle with this one, but I think Chicago wins this game. I think Chicago's defense makes the play. Uh, it could be a, a fumble to save the game. It could be a block kick, an interception to end a drive. But I think Chicago makes the play to win this one on Sunday night. So those are my picks. I'm taking Chicago, the Chargers, the Patriots, Raiders, 49ers, Washington, Saints, Vikings, Ravens, Bills, Colts, Lions, Panthers, and I took the Browns this week. Those are my week 11 picks. So that out of the way, I took the Browns Thursday night. As we all know, this was a heavily contested game. This was a very heated game. This is a division rivalry game. You've got a team in the Browns that have not been playing up to par, that are the most penalized team, that look very undisciplined, that do not look on the same page, that are getting frustrated, that are uh, you know feeling it from the media, feeling it from the fans. I'm sure they're feeling it within their own building. Coming into Pittsburgh, nationally televised game, all the lights on, all the eyes on them. Steelers, they've won four in a row. They're getting some confidence. They're starting to feel good about themselves, knowing that they're getting it done and coming together as a team without Big Ben, without Antonio Brown, without Le'Veon Bell. So you've got bravado and desperation coming into a, a, a division rivalry game on nationally televised night. That kind of sets the stage. Now, from opening tip, you could see this was going to be a very physical game. Both of these teams were planning on being physical. It was going to be a typical AFC North type battle. You have players getting hurt throughout the game. You have um, players ejected for helmet to helmet hits throughout the game. Juju Smith gets hurt. Uh, Burnett gets hurt. Corner for Cleveland gets ejected. Randall for uh, the helmet to helmet. The Steelers receivers got blood coming out of his ear. So crazy game. Uh, physical injuries, 
battling, ejections, leads us to the final eight seconds of the game. Let's say final minute of the game. Cleveland's up 21 to 7. Pittsburgh gets the ball left. Not much time left on the clock. You know they're not going anywhere. Why have your best players on the field in that moment? Why rush the passer in that moment? Why risk anything like this happening if you're the coach? And hindsight again, this whole situation, let me preface this now. First, hindsight's 2020. It's real easy for us to look at this situation after the fact, pick it apart and say, this is what they should have done. This is what I would have done without actually being in that situation or feeling what any of those emotions or the tugs or the kicks or the pulls or the grabs were like. It's really easy to go along and vilify what we see as being the, the more aggressive thing or the thing that we find most shocking uh, outweighs any wrong that anybody else did in the situation. We've done that with domestic violence in athletes, and we're now doing that in this situation. I will also say, I do not think anyone in this situation is blameless. They all deserve punishments. They all deserve to understand that what they're doing for a living and making all that money to do is very much a privilege. It is a very special and unique thing to be able to go out there and perform and play that game or any professional sport and get paid what you do to do that. Nobody has an excuse for their actions in what took place in the final eight seconds of that game. Not the coaches, not the players involved, and not the individuals who ran from the bench or ran from a different part of the field to get themselves involved. Now, let's be really real about this situation, because I all week have been wanting to say something about it all since Thursday, all week since Thursday, I've been wanting to talk about this. I've been watching the videos. I've been reading the opinions. I've been seeing people call Miles Garrett a coward and a fake tough guy, and uh, he should be banished and he should never play again. Look, what he did was 100% wrong. When you are on that field, you are competitors, but you are all brothers, and you do not try and injure anybody at any time. And that's exactly what your intent is when you swing a helmet, is to hurt the individual you are swinging it at. You are not trying to intimidate. <coughs> so let's be very clear about that. I'm not going to be making excuses for anybody involved. I am going to be very real about my analysis and my thoughts about what did transpire from beginning to end of the incident. Like I said, the coaches, sh one, should not have had Miles Garrett or any of the other starters out on the field anymore with basically a snap left in the game. There was no reason to rush the passer. There was no reason to get a sack. Now, everybody wanted to say after the sack took place, after the hit, it wasn't a late hit or it would have been flagged, that Miles Garrett then did not get up off of Rudolph. On Thursday, I kind of felt the same thing. On Friday, I kind of felt the same thing. When I was seeing it, it looked like he did kind of give that half a second pause, that second pause while he was on top of him. Then I've seen more of the film. I'm analyzing more of the film. Let me see what actually happened. Let me take my instant reaction out of this because it's shocking what we saw. And on the sack, what you see is you see a quarterback in Mason Rudolph who gets frustrated that that happened at that point in the game. And he instantly starts to try and rip off the helmet. So it is not a matter of Miles Garrett did not get up or would not get up off the quarterback. He could not get up. His head, his helmet, was being grabbed and ripped off by his opponent. That's the start of the incident. Mason Rudolph doesn't get pissed. He's being sacked and tackled and taken to the ground with eight seconds left and react the way he does. We don't know where it transpires. I'm going to be able to use that a lot throughout my talk. 
Freddie Kitchens doesn't have Miles Garrett on the field in that situation. We don't know if something else transpires. So first, Mason Rudolph makes a decision. Miles Garrett then has the option of going, okay, this guy's ripping on my head. I'm not going to do anything, or I'm going to protect myself and fight and battle. He chose to fight and battle. I don't know if you've been in that situation before. I have. When your head is being jerked, your face mask is being ripped, and your neck's being turned, it's instant instinct to try and protect yourself from having your neck broken. That fear kicks in. I'm not saying that's what happened here. I know that's happened for me. I know that's happened for other people. We've heard talk about it since Thursday night. Miles decides and to go ahead and he's going to grab the face mask too. He starts ripping at the face mask, pulling Mason off the ground. It appears at that point, Mason's trying to protect himself. He decides he's going to start kicking. It appears he kicks Miles Garrett in the groin. Appears. We don't know. We don't have a groin camera. It appears. Regardless, he is kicking, whether he made contact or not, because of what's happening. So now, Miles has made a wrong decision. Had he not made that decision, we don't know if Rudolph would have decided to kick. Now Rudolph has decided to kick. So what does Miles do? He, at that point, gets the helmet off. Villanueva gets between them, gets Miles Garrett back. Situation, then again, right there, had the opportunity to end. But we had another wrong decision in this equation. Mason Rudolph decided, I'm heated, I'm macho too. Rushes back over. Appears to try and swing around Villanueva. To get back at Garrett appears in some still shots to be a groin shot. So he's making wrong decisions again. Garrett then makes his next wrong decision. He's got this thing in his hand. Quarterback's coming back at him. He's striking around the lineman. He decides to swing because his other hand is also occupied on the offensive lineman. He swings, he makes contact, neck shortens on Rudolph. He looks at the ref like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that happened. We got in a fight and somebody swung something. From there, Miles Garrett is knocked to the ground. Uh, the Browns player, I can't pronounce his name, Akbara. I, 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 I'm sorry, I know I'm butchering the name. He pushes uh, Rudolph to the ground from the back. While Villanueva now has Miles Garrett on the ground, Pouncey simultaneously is diving through the air to punch and kick him in the head. Bunch of guys rush in, a little bit of a pushing match. It all kind of breaks apart. Everybody's in shock at this point. Everybody's responsible for their own actions in this melee. It is not a matter of Marcus Pouncey getting to say, he was attacking my guy, I blacked out. He was going to the ground when you decided to start punching and kicking him. Your guy had been attacked, was not being attacked. That excuse does not fly for me. You had every opportunity not to get involved and chose to. The guys who ran off the bench, you know the rules as well. Were there variables? Yes. Were there extenuating circumstances that led to all of this? Sure. At the end of it, all of them were wrong. So we get to the the punishment phase. Both teams find $250,000. The three black players suspended. The white quarterback may be fined, but probably not suspended. So the person who started it, the person who continued to instigate it, That's what he's responsible for. His actions, not Miles Garrett actions, Mason Rudolph's actions that he forgot to mention in his press conference while he's calling somebody else a coward. He might get fined for. Marcus Pouncey, in my opinion, his suspension was not long enough 
Three games, he deserved a minimum of six, in my opinion. The the Browns player, the defensive end who got the one-game suspension, I think all he deserved was a fine. He pushed a guy in the back and knocked him to the ground. That's a personal foul. That's a 15-yard penalty. So that's what, a $20,000 fine normally, 15000 for personal fouls like that? That's not a suspension-worthy event. But, again... This is why I call it the whitewashing effect. We've villainized the big bad black man because he made contact with the helmet while making an excuse for the white player, the quarterback who we've so decided we have to protect so much on the football field over the last decade, and we're excusing his actions. All three black players get suspensions. The white player doesn't. And I hate that my mind goes there, but that's where we are as a society right now. That's the lens things are now looked through by many of us. It very much was an if this, then that scenario. It very much was I reacted, he reacted, I reacted, he reacted. Nobody was right. We can't just villainize Miles Garrett because he had a helmet in his hand and that's more shocking. You can't take one singular moment out of an entire incident, and that's how you frame it. My problem is not with the punishment. Miles Garrett deserves his indefinite suspension. I will say that again. 16 games minimum to get your act together, to think about what you just did and how you're going to prevent yourself from ever doing something like that again. And if you get the opportunity to come back, to prove that you are never going to do anything along those lines again. And to the people who want to point out, oh, he he pushed Delaney Walker earlier in the season. That happens five times a game minimum. Every NFL game, every week, every college game, every week. There's going to be big linemen, tight ends, (coughs) safeties, receivers, corners, running backs that are pushing each other after the whistle or pushing each other in the head, that's not being dirty. The other one that was floated out this Friday after this incident about Miles Garrett to try and villainize him was the hit on Trevor Simeon. It was not a late hit. It was not flagged for a late hit that I remember. If Simeon does not try and brace himself with the foot as he falls and just takes it back, the foot doesn't get pinned underneath him. That's not on Miles Garrett either. He was not trying to hurt him. That was a crazy thing that just kind of happened. I've been involved in those kind of injuries on the field too. You've seen different things where guys get rolled up all the time. It's the same kind of thing. That's what happened with Trevor Simeon and the Miles Garrett. But we're trying to villainize him because, ooh, look, that's what we do in our society. The big, bad black man, look what he did. We're going to villainize what he's doing. My problem with Everything that I've heard over the last couple couple days with this is how it's being portrayed, the narrative around it. We're not being real. We're not talking about the whole incident. And we're letting Mason Rudolph off as if he wasn't also being fake tough. When you're growing up with your little brother and sister, right, and they're annoying you and you let it go, and they're annoying you and they let it go, and then they're annoying you and you let it go, and then that one time you react and you push them or you hit them or you knock them to the ground and they cry and then you get in trouble. That was what Mason Rudolph's role was in this whole thing. The instigator. He kept coming back, kept coming back, kept coming back as if nothing was going to happen to him. As if he wasn't realizing something could happen, that that guy might swing my helmet that he still has in his hand. And Miles Garrett never stopped to go, I shouldn't do this. They are all wrong. Made bad choices in the moment that we can't understand outside of the moment in hindsight. So unless you can be real about a situation, don't pick a side. Don't villainize one over the other. Lay out the whole situation and let people decide how they feel about the whole situation. 
I'm disgusted by him swinging the helmet. But we've seen it before. T.J. Lang called him out, and I've respected T.J. Lang for his time in Green Bay and his time in Detroit and his time as a player. You can go watch video of T.J. Lang doing the same thing in fights and in scuffles where he's grabbing a guy's face mask and ripping it off his head. Now, he doesn't swing at him with it, but it's, it's the same thing. It didn't get to the point where he could swing on it because there was no room to swing. It didn't get further than that because the guy he took the helmet off of didn't then instigate it further. So the problem is not whether or not Miles Garrett was wrong. The problem was not whether or not he should be punished. The problem is the narrative right now around this situation and what it seems to, again, be in this country, a perception of racial uh, 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 fairness and justice and equality. That's my problem with it. Outside of the fact it never should have taken place in the first place. That being said, what should have taken place a long time ago, what should have taken place any time over the last three years, and is now taking place later this afternoon, is the Colin Kaepernick workout for NFL teams, or a NFL team. We know Jay-Z hired on, partnered up with the NFL a few weeks back. Uh, social justice reform, kind of be involved and spearhead that kind of thing for the league because, hey, face it, one of their biggest uh, uh, um, publicity downfalls outside of domestic violence over the last few years has been their stance on social justice, shutting players down, uh, taking away their voice, siding with 45 over the players starting with Kaepernick, blackballing him from the league, and admitting so when you settle with him. So this workout has nothing to do with saving face or legal anything because they're settled. It's not going anywhere. He can't come back at them for this same thing anymore. So why this workout now? Well, it seems like it's very much connected to Jay-Z, right? I mean, where, where else would this all of a sudden be coming from? It's not about saving face. It's not a publicity stunt because they don't need one. They settled. That's done from their perspective. So what's the motivation to do this now outside of another influence saying, let's do this. Let's try and get some of these fans back. Let's try and appease some of the people who are just emotional who aren't deep into it, who aren't, you know, or who are only really surface level with this stuff. So we have this workout. From what we know, Kaepernick and his representatives were notified this week that it was going to take place. They asked for it to take place on what generally the NFL do Monday or a Tuesday when they normally do these type of workouts, the NFL said, no, we're doing it on this day. We're, we're only filming it for teams. There will be no media. Um, we're not going to allow you to know this information, that information. There's speculation all week whether or not Kaepernick would show. Then we found out he's in Atlanta already. Uh, we don't know who the receivers are. So former NFL receivers have volunteered and flown themselves into Atlanta to help Kaepernick work out. We have found out that Hugh Jackson, uh, the former Browns head coach, offensive coordinator for several teams, will be leading the workout. There will be a measurement. There will be um, the, a small workout phase, 30 or 40 throws, and then interviews. We've heard there's anywhere from 11 to 24 teams that are going to be represented. Uh, we've heard Patriots, Dolphins, Broncos, Lions, Cardinals, Falcons, Browns, Giants, Jets, Bucks, Redskins. And for some people, that sounds great. He's getting his chance, right? <coughs> Other people are like, this is a PR stunt. Let's be real about it. Let's say he, he kills it today, and a team does want to sign him, and in the next couple weeks, somebody signs Colin Kaepernick to a contract to come in. Okay, so two, three weeks go by, somebody signs him. Then he's going to need another two, three weeks to pick up the 
offense before you're really going to put him out there. If you're being fair to the player. So now you're talking anywhere from four to six weeks down the line. We're in week 11. So you're talking week 15 to 17. So he might come in and play maybe a game or two. What's the use of that at this point? Why are teams interested now? In my mind, instantly goes to what can they gain by doing this? Because it's not to keep themselves out of any uh, litigation. Again, that's over. He's settled. He can't come back for collusion anymore. So there, there is the group that's doing their due diligence, that's just sending a representative because that's what you should do. If there's a viable prospect out there, you should know about it. You should be checking into it. I personally don't think anything comes of it. I don't think anybody signs him this season. I think there's a very small possibility that after today's workout, somebody is willing to bring him in next year for mini camps starting in like what, May, April. They'll sign him in the league year sometime in March if they're interested to bring him in and see how it takes, if they're willing to put up with the media, if they're willing to put up with the fans that might not like it, if they're willing to put up with the racists and the bigots out there who are going to say he hates the country and want to go after him. When that's not anything that he stood for or is about. So I I, I very much don't know how to look at this Um or why now? I, I, I don't have an answer for that. I'm at a loss. Because it doesn't make sense to have it at this point in the season. Um, outside of you're trying to buy some fans back. You're trying to buy those surface level emotional people that just react to things. And have them jump back to the side of spending money on the NFL. Because, again, there's not enough time for him to fully get acclimated and have a fair shot of showing anything in an NFL game this season. If he signed today, by week 17, the final game of the regular season, maybe you could get him in to get some snaps and have a fair representation of what he might be able to do in an NFL game. But you're not bringing him in to be a starter right now. If anything, he has to come in as basically a backup role and be on the team. So why now? Why not do this in the offseason? Why not do it after the Super Bowl? Why now? And I, I can't figure that out. Why now? I know Roger Goodell came out and has said as much that Jay-Z was a big influence in this workout. But they're very much controlling the narrative around it. They're very much controlling the information around it. And that's what puts red flags up. It makes people suspicious. It makes people question the motives. So we'll see. I mean, we're not going to, I guess we won't see. We'll hear about it later. Um, but I, I, I just don't think it goes anywhere. It makes sense for it to go anywhere this season. <laughs> Even for some of the teams that are on there. Like, what are the Patriots going to do with him? Nothing. The Dolphins, if you're going to sign him, why haven't you signed him to this point or brought him in on your own to this point? Are, you, are all these teams really just waiting to see if uh, Daddy Roger says it's okay? Are they waiting to see if he's going to be put on some kind of exemption list? Are they waiting to see how the media and the, the fan base might take it? Because the Broncos are, the Dolphins could use him. The Broncos could use him. The Lions could definitely use him right now. Uh, the Cardinals don't need him, but he'd be a nice backup to uh, Kyler Murray, he'd fit in there pretty well. The Falcons, if something happens, they don't have a backup. Uh, I don't really see him fitting in with what the Browns are doing, but he could be a good backup to Baker Mayfield. Giants, I don't know why they would send anybody or the Jets because they just got their young quarterback that they've turned the reins over to. Um, the Bucks potentially, that is a actually a site that I could see him playing next season because we don't know what Jameis Winston's status is going to be. He's not re-upped after this season. Uh, Washington, they just drafted Dwayne Haskins. But does the next coaching regime, whoever that's going to be, want to go for? Or do they pull another Arizona and draft another quarterback this year? So that is a possibility there with Washington as well. <coughs> He's a player 
just like Carmelo Anthony, who deserved a shot a long time ago, and now Melo is similar to Cap, getting his shot. Uh, Portland has signed him to a non-guaranteed contract. They've been struggling there in Portland with injuries this year. And it seems, honestly, I thought they were going to be a very competitive team in the West right now. Right now, early in the season, they are on the outside looking in as far as those top eight seeds. But you add Melo to CJ, you add Melo to Dame, um, you have veteran leadership who have won titles in Pau Gasol, you have young, fiery players like Zach Collins, uh, you have a Rodney Hood who, you know, he can give you his moments. You have Joseph Nurkic, who's working his way back still from uh, injuries. Anthony Simmons, who, who's, you know, been up and down this year, but is promising. Hassan Whiteside uh, started off a little better this season than what he's playing right now, making a lot of money um, not to do a whole lot. But this is a team, they have big men, they have shooting, they can play the inside out, they have rim protection. Um, they have a guy like Jalen Horde out of Wake Forest. Um, so I think adding Mello, and if it works out, great. And if not, it's a non-guaranteed contract. It didn't work out for our team. I think Mello's good enough to be on any team in the NBA. In my opinion, that's just how it is. Uh, is he the best defender? No. Is he the best assist guy? No. Is he the best rebounder? No. He is very much an ISO wing scorer player. He needs to be set up, he needs to be put in good positions, and he's quality. He's a good leader, he's a good locker room guy. The only people that ever give Mello a bad name have been the media. You don't hear it from former teammates very, very much, or if at all. I can't really remember a former teammate bad-mouthing uh, Carmelo Anthony. Um, but I think he came around at a time with guys like Dwayne Wade and LeBron James who were that team leader, who were that guy who took things over, who were more of the, the Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan mold. And Mello was more of the James Worthy mold, more of the the um, Ray Allen almost, not the three-point sense, but that wing-type player. He's not really the leader. He's a really good player, but he's not the guy. And you see that again. I've said this so many times on the show. It, with Melo and in his international play, when he had a Jason Kidd, when he played with LeBron James in those international selling settings, he killed it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. I, I would love for it to work out there in Portland. And if not, I hope he gets another chance. I hope Melo can finish this year and get a ring somewhere. Uh, I think that would be awesome. Astros got a ring in 2017. It comes out. We got a pitcher coming out. I'm not going to talk about this too much because I think it's kind of a let's wait and see story. But former Astros pitcher comes out, says that they had a camera in center field, that they would use it to steal signs. That camera sent footage to an iPad. Somebody would see the sign and then bang on a trash can in some kind of a pattern to allow the Astros hitter to know at home games what pitch was coming. At first... I was kind of like, okay, not surprised. It's baseball, sign stealing, trying to use technology. Um, as much as that sucks and that's wrong, who really cares? Then I really went that direction when I found out that their batting average at home that season was worse than it was on the road. So if this investigation finds that they were in fact doing this, it didn't help them any. It backfired. It probably was a distraction to the hitter who's now trying to decipher a drum beat in the half a second before the pitcher was able to make the pitch while still reading the pitch to make sure that the drum beat he heard matches what he's seeing and able to swing in that point two four or point three four whatever seconds it is you have to decide and swing the bat. Should they be punished if it was true? Yes, cheating is cheating. But isn't part of the punishment then just being found out that not only did you cheat, but it didn't work and it actually hurt your team because your batting average was lower than it was when you weren't doing it? So we'll see where this goes. I mean, it seems like Carlos Beltran and uh, Alex Cora, the two managers of the Mets and the Red Sox, who were working for the Astros at the time, 
were apparently involved in this. So I can expect that they're probably going to be interviewed by Major League Baseball and could be the deciding fact as to whether or not this goes anywhere is their testimony or their account of what happened or what didn't happen. Obviously, they couldn't do this on the road. Nobody would allow them to set up a camera on the road. So we'll see. It's, you know, it's Spygate. It's the Patriots. It's stretching the rules as far as you can before you get caught and getting in trouble. It's happened over and over in athletics. It will continue to happen because of the money, prestige, and stuff like that that is involved. As sad as it is, um, and as sad as this week in sports turned out to be with the incidents that we had to talk about, with the still face, facing racial injustice and uh, whitewashing of stories with you know, trying to hurt fellow competitors on the field with stealing signs to try and gain a competitive advantage. Let's just hope the games we have today, the games we have tomorrow, and some of this NBA action that's been amazing, NHL action that's been amazing, early on in the season continues and that we're going to have more positive stories moving forward than more of these negative stories we talked about today. But that's real. That's what it is. And until next time, you know how we do. Just be real.